Hello. Hello. Hey, hi. Hi, good evening, everyone. We're so excited to have you joining us today. Um, I'm Liz Archuleta, and I'm the Arizona spokesperson for ECHO Hispanics Enjoying Camping, Hunting, and the Outdoors. And um, we have our ECHO team assembled here today. Camilla, do you want to say hello to everybody? Yeah, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm so excited about tonight's program and to have all your smiling faces here. So thanks. I'm, I'm Camilla, the executive director of ECHO. Welcome. And Amy? And Amy? Yes, hi, everybody. My name is Amy Dominguez. I am ECHO's communications coordinator. I'm excited to be a part of this advocacy training with everyone. Great. Well, thanks everyone for your hour um, tonight. We really appreciate it. This is ECHO's digital briefing and advocacy training on protecting the Grand Canyon from uranium. This evening, we're joined from um, folks from Arizona, Utah, Virginia, New York, Colorado, New Mexico, and Georgia. And we want to thank you so much again um, for, and for wanting to learn more about the threat of uranium mining to the Grand Canyon and what we can do today and in the coming months to protect this iconic and very important national park. Um, I'm from Coconino County, Arizona, and within Coconino County is the Grand Canyon. So I um, grew up in Arizona and um, have, of course, seen the Grand Canyon since I was a kid and taken several visitors there. And, it's so great that ECHO advocates um, not only for the Grand Canyon, but advocates on a number of issues and is a platform for Hispanics to, to be heard um, in the issues related to our public lands. This is part one of a two-part series. And um, today includes a short briefing on the issue of uranium mining at the Grand Canyon and the risk to this natural wonder and iconic crown jewel of our national parks. Today we'll go over some strategies on how you can become an effective advocate and some easy ways to advocate for the Grand Canyon. Now next month, which is the second part of this training series, we'll focus on some formal ways to advocate for an issue through print media. We'll hear from a guest speaker with experience in working with the media on effective strategies to get our point of view communicated. And to express our thanks for all of you for joining us in this two-part series, um, you'll receive a certificate from ECHO. And then once you complete the five very simple advocacy actions that we're going to ask from you, you will receive an ECHO t-shirt. And so we're really excited to be able to give that to you. And so Camilla and I, we're going to go through a spotlight. We, we want to hear um, who you are. So if you would just share your name and your location, where are you located right now? That would be great. And so we'll spotlight you and um, that will, you will know when your face gets uh, to the full screen, that it's your turn to introduce yourself. It looks like Camilla, you're on. I'm on, I put myself on first. I forgot to mention earlier that, uh, so I'm Camilla and I am in Richmond, Virginia. Oh, hello, everyone. It's me again. Um, I'm Amy. I am in Salt Lake City, Utah. Hi, my name's Nikki, and I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm with the Arizona Wildlife Federation. Hi all, I hope you all can hear me. I'm in Flagstaff, Arizona. My name is Becca, and you can tell I'm in Flagstaff because you can probably hear a train in the background. Thanks for having me. Uh, good evening, I'm Jim. I'm in Flagstaff, Arizona. Hi, I'm Laura. I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I um, volunteer a lot with uh, New Mexico Wildlife Federation. Hi, everyone. I'm Michael. I'm in New York City. Hi, 
Hi everyone, my name is Morgan Moore. I'm with Audubon, Arizona, and I'm calling from Mesa, Arizona. Hi everyone, I'm Viviana Reyes and I'm in Flagstaff, Arizona, ETRA Advisory Board Member. Great, and I'm just trying to get, I think I might have missed a few people, um, but I think it was because they're not in video. So let's open it up to anyone else that, that I skipped who wasn't on video at the time. Barbecue place. Hi everyone, it's Rebecca Chavez Hauk in Salt Lake City, ECHO Advisory Board Member. And did we have one more person, I think? Okay, well, it looks like we have everybody covered, Camilla. Great, okay, then. Uh... Liz, take it away. Thank you. Great. So we're going to um, we're going to share our screen um, right now, and um, Camilla is going to put up a couple of maps that I wanted to um, just kind of take you through because this will show basically what the area that we are uh, talking about when it comes to the uh, Grand Canyon. And so the first map that we have up is a, a map that just shows you this um, incredible area for recreation. And so I just want to, let's take a look as we just kind of get oriented here. Let's talk a little bit about the um, people and the populations around the Grand Canyon. And so if I just uh, take the cursor and Camilla, can you see my cursor? Um, I actually, I'm gonna, I'll do the cursor for you. So you talk oh, me through perfect. it. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's just go to the, the top of the map and we see Vermilion Cliffs. And um, that is an incredible area. That's where the uh, condors were released in, in Arizona. It's a beautiful area for, um, for hiking and for sightseeing. Um, where Camilla is actually pointing Above that would be the Utah border, and you'll see Kanab that she's circling right there, um, Kanab and Utah. And then if we go through and we look at the, uh, if we start over here, Camilla, and we go down to the south entrance of the Grand Canyon, go down to the Grand Canyon, we'll see some towns. We'll take you to Jacob Lake um, as we go down. Right there is the Grand Jacob Lake, right there where you're at. Yes, that's the wonderful uh, northern rim um, where people go and can, if you're lucky enough, you'll be able to, you can go over there and see that. That's not open year round. And then if you keep on going down, you'll see the actual south rim. Follow down towards the map and you see the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Right there at the entrance is the town of Tucson. Um, that's the small town that you go through. And in the Grand Canyon, there's about um, 2,000 people that actually live there. Further, you go down further down the map and you see the city of Williams and then the city of Flagstaff. The city of Flagstaff is the largest city in Coconino County at about 75,000 people. Um, you also probably notice the Colorado River, uh, which of course is a major water source for over 40 million people. And so just to get you oriented, and then you'll see like there's a number, the Grand Canyon Parachute Monument, if you go over here to the, the west of the map, the left side of the map up above, um, there's that monument and then Lake Mead National Recreation Area. So this entire area is just some um, an incredible um, public lands area, outdoor recreation area. Let's go to the next map and the next slide and you can kind of see we're going to talk a little bit about the federal land management agencies with the next map. Um, and this map is a map of the various types of public lands. And the purple, which you see right in the middle, that is the entirety of the Grand Canyon. And that is managed by the National Park Service. And the green, 
uh, you will see that that is uh, national forest managed by the Forest Service. And then the yellow, um, the light colored yellow, that is all Bureau of Land Management lands. And you're probably wondering what that blue and white checkerboard is. Well, the blue is Arizona state lands down at the southern part of the map and also on the, on the uh, north part of the map. You will see that that is state land and then the white part is private land. So there's a diversity of public lands in this area. And of course, with the different types of public lands come different protections and uses for that land. Now look at, pay attention to the map and see the areas that are outlined in red. These are managed by a mix of Bureau of Land Management, BLM, and forest lands. And these lands are not managed by the National Park Service. Um, National Park Service land has the greatest levels of protection. So if it, were, if it were not for the temporary moratorium, the 20 year moratorium on the lands that are outlined in red, these lands would be subjective, subjected to uranium mining claims, and which they have been, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. And I'll show you those, um, those particular areas on the next slide. So the areas that are, in, that are outlined in red. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so you remember the areas that were in red. Um, here's a different, here they are on a different map. And here on this map, you'll see a, what we have is a temporary ban on uranium mining, the 20 year moratorium. These are the lands that are now, they were outlined in red before, now they're outlined in green. And this is what is referred to these lands as the 1 million acre withdrawal of land from uranium mining. And here you'll see that the locations of the, uranium, the uranium mines, these are the black and white symbols that are round symbols. You can see how, how close they are um, to Utah, to the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. And um, the Grand, Grand Staircase Escalante, you might remember that that is the monument that the um, current administration, the Trump administration reduced from nearly 1.9 million acres to about a million acres in order to free up land for uranium mining there. And then you also might um, remember Bears Ears National Monument. That was also reduced in its original size from 1.3 million acres to roughly 228,000 acres. So what we are seeing is that there are over 2,000 uranium mining claims within 10 miles of the Grand Canyon National Park. And that's like since 2003, there's over 2,000 uranium mining, uranium mining claims. So when you think about uranium mining and transportation of the uranium, you have to, it has to be able to get um, you know, from the Grand Canyon area to, to where it's going, um, to where it's going to be used. And so that uranium, if it was to be extracted from the um, area within the Grand Canyon, would need to travel through to Flagstaff, Arizona, or through Williams. And I would be taken by truck through Flagstaff and then it could then get on rail um, or it could get um, further go by truck on the I-40, Interstate 40 corridor, the East and West corridor, or the Interstate 17 corridor. Um, Interstate 17 is a north-south corridor. And so um, the city of Flagstaff, the city council, um, De has expressed um, opposition for a number of years about transporting uranium through through the city. And um, the Board of Supervisors of Coconino County, of which I am on the Board of Supervisors, we have a very long history, as a matter of fact, since 2008, of um, expressing our opposition to uranium mining at the Grand Canyon. So there has been a um, temporary moratorium on making um, uranium mining claims and what we're going to talk about now is just the current state of that and that is that the administration, the current administration is looking to lift that moratorium. And I'll turn it over to Camilla to uh, speak to what the current status is of that. Great, thank you Liz. All right, um, so yes, well first the good news. Um, so the current status is that uh, House Natural Resource Chairman Raul Bujalva from Arizona um, introduced a bill to permanently protect the Grand Canyon. Just, um, it, you know, 
permanently have the moratorium on um, mining in that area. And on March 30th, that bill passed the House. Um, so that is a bit of good news. Um, an additional bit of good news is that Senator Sinema from Arizona as well introduced a corresponding bill in the Senate um, to do the same. Um, and so the, these pieces of legislation together, if signed, if, if they make it through the Senate, and if it makes it through the Senate and then signed by um, the president, would permanently protect the Grand Canyon by making the moratorium permanent. So that would be really awesome. Um, the other piece of good news, and I think we're all pretty much on the same page about this, most of us are at least, is that public opinion is consistently against new uranium mining claims. Um, and most of Arizona's leaders are in line with that public opinion. Here you see 71% oppose allowing new uranium mining claims on existing public lands near the Grand Canyon. Um, however, there are so others who are quiet <laughs> or silent, um, and we do need them to speak up. Um, and so uh, also, of course, there are a few who are actively pursuing uh, uranium mining in what they call the Arizona Strip. Um, and so as a result, the current administration has been setting the table for uranium mining. And um, the day after Earth Day, the administration's nuclear fuels working group released a report with recommendations um, for how uh, to um, start up uranium mining um, in the United States. And it basically creates a false urgency to develop a national stockpile of uranium just for the purpose of reviving the uranium mining sector. Here's a bulleted list of things that um, we found in the report. So some of the key points um, that are mentioned in this report and recommendations are that we need to restore America's dominance of the nuclear industry. We need to revive the sector, the uranium sector. We need to create a stockpile of uranium over, the, over a period of 10 years. And during those 10 years, United States taxpayers would be the purchasers of all the uranium, all that uranium mined in the US at, at a cost of $1.5 billion over those 10 years. Um, this, these recommendations also include um, <laughs> an, urge, an ur urging for decreasing permitting and regulatory burdens to industry. Um, so that means, you know, that's not really great news, um, as well as reforming environmental regulations um, and streamlining land access for uranium extraction. So you can see why some of us, even though it's not outright mentioned, the Grand Canyon is not specifically mentioned in Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante are not specifically mentioned in here, but um, the table is definitely being set and we're uh, really concerned about that. Um, we are seeing news reports that are confirming that concern. Trump nuclear energy plan could reopen areas near the Grand Canyon to uranium mining. And um, that was our own read. We put out a statement that also highlights the risk to public health and safety. And the timing of this can't be more um, kind of inappropriate when our country and the, and the globe is facing um, massive public health crisis. Um, here we are trying to um, you know, make that worse. And so we um, are very concerned about that. And that's why we're holding this briefing and trying to get the word out about this. Okay, so to... let's talk a little bit about is uranium mining appropriate at the Grand Canyon? So when I think of the Grand Canyon, I think of Arizona. And um, let's just take a moment. If you remember back at those, if you can think back to the maps that I showed you, those great areas, Vermilion Cliffs, the Grand Canyon, the um, Grand Staircase Escalante, that whole area. Can you just quickly in the chat, just um, let us know, have you been to any of those places? Have you been to Jacob's Lake? Have you been to the Grand Canyon? Uh, did you go to the North Rim, the South Rim? Um, have you been to Vermilion Cliffs? Have you been to Flagstaff or Williams? So just, just which places in the area, thinking back to those maps that I showed you, um, have you been to? Just take a few moments.
Oh, great. So some people have been to the South Ram. Somebody plans to visit the Havasupai. This fits all that. So make sure you go to um, Havasupai Falls, that incredibly blue, beautiful waterfall that's just iconic when you think of the Grand Canyon. Amazing. Page, yes, Page, Arizona. Because on that map too was, um, was Lake Powell. And then over in Nevada on that map was also Lake Mead. Um, yeah, and someone just wrote the North Rim is great because it's not as crowded and it's just, it's beautiful. Yeah, the North Rim is amazing. Well, that's great. So when I think about the North Rim, when I think about the, the South Rim, when I think about Williams Flagstaff, I mean, um, you just, Oh, Antelope Canyon is a, is a definitely a must. So when I think of the Grand Canyon, I think of Arizona. And, and if you look at there on the screen, the Grand Canyon State welcomes you, Arizona. It's iconic. It's one and the same, the Grand Canyon in Arizona. The Grand Canyon is the crown jewel. It's a national icon. Um, it's a place where we have incredible tourism and an outdoor recreation economy. So I just want to give you a few facts when we ask ourselves, is uranium mining appropriate at the Grand Canyon? Just want you to think about this. Arizona's identity is associated with the Grand Canyon. They're one and the same. Arizona is economically dependent on tourism from the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is visited by almost 7 million visitors annually and directly supports the local economy with $947 million, which is spent by visitors um, that come to visit the, the Grand Canyon. It's the Grand Canyon's outdoor recreation, visitation, and associated businesses support the 1.2 billion, with a B, local economy. And those, um, the people that come to the Grand Canyon and have associated business that go and visit and go to associated businesses, that creates 12,558 jobs in Coconino County alone. So you can see that, you know, my county, Coconino County is very dependent um, on tourism from the Grand Canyon and the associated businesses as well as Arizona. The Grand Canyon also has tribal and cultural significance. Somebody mentioned that they were going to go to Havasupai, and here you see um, a member of the Havasupai tribe. The Grand Canyon is home to the Havasupai tribe. They live at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. There's, there's the falls um, that I was talking about, um, Havasupai Falls, which is an incredible place. Um, the Grand Canyon is, is culturally significant to several indigenous tribes. Um, Native American tribes, the Navajo Diné people, it's significant to them. It's significant to, to Latinos um, and to, you know, it's, it's historic. And then the third thing when we think about is uranium mining appropriate at the Grand Canyon is that we can't forget this um, legacy that uranium mining has left. Historically, uranium mining has left a toxic legacy. Um, it's not a positive legacy, it's a negative legacy that has been especially felt by the Navajo Nation. Um, over 500 uranium mines remain abandoned and they still need to be remediated. And so the remediation of contaminated and abandoned uranium mines across northern Arizona is not only a public health threat, um, but it's an environmental health priority. And um, you'll hear stories of people on the Navajo Nation. You see this here on the, the right side of the screen. Um, you'll see these different red dots. These are abandoned uranium mines on and near the Navajo Nation. And this is when uranium mining was being mined um, during World War II. And it, they were surface mines and then they were abandoned because um, they, there was a better quality uranium, uranium that was found beneath the surface in other areas. And so basically the mining companies just abandoned these mines. And what happened is the, the Navajo people um, began to build their houses and communities and schools um, on this land. And as a result, um, they, you know, have been struck with cancer and it's been a health hazard and an environmental house hazard to the Diné people. And um, right now, Coconino County for a number of years, for decades, has been pleading with the federal government and advocating to have these mines remediated um, for someone to take responsibility for the, these, these abandoned mines. 
So again, we're asking ourselves, is uranium, is uranium mining appropriate at the Grand Canyon? So let's talk a little bit about advocacy. I've mentioned advocacy a couple of times and I'm gonna turn it over to Amy to take us through this, um, this idea of what is advocacy and, and how do we do it? Liz, so exactly what Liz was just talking about, it's important to advocate for these special places. Um, so we'll take it all the way back and start by defining advocacy. Well, what does it mean? Um, advocacy is the act or process of supporting a cause or proposal, the act or process of advocating for something. And so now we'll go ahead and take a quick poll. So you should see a little pop up come up and it'll be asking, here we go. Have you ever been asked to advocate for something? And it's just a yes or no. So go ahead and click on the answer that most applies. Awesome. Okay. So it looks like we've had quite a couple people advocate for something and that's exciting. It's important to do and important to participate. Awesome. So when we take a step back and we ask why we advocate for things and why it's important, we step back and think about how it's important to raise awareness, to gain support, organize, and mobilize people. Um, advocating is important to educate and inform decision makers. It's important to gather and share data to highlight needs and concerns within the community as well. And so we move into the different types of advocacy actions that we can take. Uh, I'm sure that many of us have called or written to our representatives before. Um, we can also use social media to educate and engage people and decision makers. Social media, we'll come to talk about a little bit more later in our presentation, is a, is a very important tool to advocacy action. Um, but you can also share stories, data, resources with leaders to illustrate the implications of their decisions, um, asking people to sign on to a petition, signing a petition ourselves, writing a letter or an op-ed to the editor, um, submitting comments about draft regulations. There's all sorts of advocacy actions that we can take. And so um, are there any others? I'd like to open up this little uh, chat box for folks to comment in types of advocacy actions that they have taken that may not be included on this list. Um, so go ahead and throw it into the chat box. Camilla repeated the question there. What other advocacy actions are there that we can include in our types of advocacy actions? And give it a couple seconds here. Yes, request to speak systems, absolutely forming a coalition, marches, absolutely, Juliana, testifying, making appointments with legislators and stakeholders, absolutely, um, lobby visits, exactly. All of these are powerful tools of um, advocacy that we can use to protect special places like the Grand Canyon. And so we'll go ahead and move into our second poll question. So what, if any, types of advocacy actions have you taken? So just take a couple seconds to select your poll uh, and have your answers in. Wow, great. It looks like quite a couple people have used social media, submitted comments, signed a petition. Great. Wow. How cool. This is, it's such a cool little tool to be able to see um, how everyone is voting. It looks like the most popular tool of advocacy that folks have used is social media to express your point of view about an issue. And that is awesome. That's really important. Looks like, yep, social media to express my point of view takes the cake. That's awesome. Um, social media, as we, as I said a little bit ago, we'll talk about a little bit more here in the next few slides about how it can be a very important tool in our advocacy work. Uh, and then I will pass it on back to our presenters. 
Hello. Yes. Okay. So thanks, Amy. We've um, kind of built a foundation about advocacy and what it is um, and what it isn't. There's uh, some confusion sometimes about the difference between advocacy and lobbying. And uh, the simple difference is really that advocacy is more issue based, um, whereas lobbying, it includes a call to action about a piece of legislation. And so that's the primary difference for the and for the purposes of this training, um, we're gonna use advocacy in that sense. So um, what are we advocating for here? So we are advocating for the protection of the Grand Canyon from uranium mining. There's a bunch of other threats to the Grand Canyon. Um, uh, you know, we talked we talked about a couple of them in some of our other um, events, like climate change and um, some, you know, overloving our parks and the need for more funding um, for maintenance. Um, but for the purposes of this training, we're really focused on the issue of, um, the potential issue of, of more uranium mining there. And so our goals for this particular advocacy campaign are twofold. First, we want to educate the public and our leaders about the opposition to uranium mining at the Grand Canyon through a digital storytelling project called My Grand Canyon Story, or hashtag My Grand Canyon Story, um, which will elevate this issue within our community and demonstrate how we will be affected. And the second part, second goal that we have is to mobilize advocacy network members to take five actions over the next 30 days. And our plan has three parts. So the first part we're implementing, we're starting to implement right now. So uh, we want to organize two virtual advocacy trainings to teach advocacy actions that protect the Grand Canyon. Um, we also want to create and elevate at least 20 My Grand Canyon Story posts. And um, third, we are looking to recruit a digital advocacy network of at least 50 members to make a powerful impact together. And so as a part of the training today, we're gonna focus on three of these five um, actions that we want to do together. Um, and those three are, the first one is we want to share your story, um, learn how to share your story, learn how to use your social media for advocacy, and also learn how to join the digital advocacy network so that you can receive action alerts and also stay up to date on the latest information about this issue. Great, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, sharing your story. So, you know, why would we want to share our story? Well. Our voices are important and we need to uh, realize that they're very impactful um, and also sharing your story and sharing a personal connection um, like the personal connection that you have to the Grand Canyon is um, something that's really authentic and our uh, leaders and our elected officials want to know that they want to know your experiences they want to know you know authentically you and so ETCHO is a platform to help elevate voices and our narrative, and in particular, elevating our ancestral and cultural connections to lands. And so um, I wanted to share a story with you as an elected official. I've been a county supervisor. Um, in some areas, they call them county commissioners, and that's how you might be familiar with um, the, the title. But I've been a county supervisor for 24 years, and um, I'll never forget in my first year when I uh, went down to the state legislature and um, was working on a, a couple of, um, advocating for a couple of issues on behalf of the county. I remember one of the representatives saying, um, oh my gosh, Liz, you know, I'm really rethinking my um, perspective on this issue. He's like, I got so many phone calls today about the issue. And I said, oh my gosh, really? I'm representative, like, like, how many calls did you get? He said, I got 20 calls. And I thought, 20 calls, oh my gosh, all I'd have to do is just would mobilize my immediate family and a couple of cousins and that would be 20 people right then and there. And if we made calls uh, to that person's office um, to think that we might be able to uh, have him you know, rethink his position. 
Um, and then I, you know, in my career as a, as a county supervisor, I remember um, this just happened a few weeks ago. Um, we got about 101 emails on a specific issue. And at about email number 32, I had some, um, one of my fellow supervisors calling me and saying, hey, Liz, you see that we're getting like this issue is really uh, bubbling up. We are getting, we have like 32 emails on this issue so far. And then about two hours later, um, it was 77 issues, 77 emails. And at about at 77, I was getting calls and they're like, um, hey, you know, Liz, since you're the chair of the board, I mean, are you thinking about this? Are you, you know, are you going to write back and, and give a county position um, regarding this issue? Um, and then at about, at 101, uh, before we let it get to that point, we had mobilized a, a response um, to the 101 emails. And so I share this with you because, you know, often people think, oh my gosh, there's so many people calling elected officials, there's so many people going to meetings of elected officials, whether it be council meetings, board of supervisor meetings, or going to the legislature to testify. People, you know, have this, this vision that we're constantly being called, um, constantly being reached out to. And I can tell you that that is, that is not true. We are not constantly being reached out to. We are not constantly receiving emails from constituents. So that when we do get um, a number of emails on an issue or a number of phone calls, it piques our interest and it piques it to the point where we think, hmm, you know, this is bubbling up. This is becoming a hot topic. Um, you know, we better, uh, you know, really look at all the facts around this and make sure that we, uh, that we're, you know, understanding um, all sides of the issue. Now we, we do that for everything, but I will tell you that when you get a lot of, when you get a lot of messages and a lot of phone calls and you get emails, um, it does, it does make a difference and it makes a difference to the point where, you know, sometimes you want to make sure and see if there's a, you know, a win-win or um, if there's a way that you can, can really meet the, um, the needs of what the constituents or residents are pointing out. So you do make a difference. And so, and one thing that's really important to me as an elected official is just that personal story. I want to know how the issue affects you. I want to know how it affects your neighbors or your community. That's really, really helpful. So, you know, hearing that, thinking, think about that. Think about your connection to the, the issue that we're talking about today. You know, what is your personal connection to the Grand Canyon? You know, when was the first time you visited the Grand Canyon? Or when is the most recent time that you visited it? I mean, what, what was going through your mind? I mean, what inspired you about that? Or what, what are you in awe of when you visited the Grand Canyon? And then think about, you know, why would you be motivated to take action? Um, around the Grand Canyon. Um, is it because of that experience the very first time you saw it? Is, do you believe that that's something that everybody should be able to experience? You know, some people are also motivated by what is the consequence of an inaction? Um, that also motivates people. So I want to share with you um, an example of that Lynn Cordova, one of our ECHO board members, um, we have a little um, story about her and about the impact the Grand Canyon has um, made on her, even though she's never visited it. So let's, let's just listen to this right now. Do we have volume?
Grand Canyon. Oh, there we go. It looks like we just caught the tail end. <laughs> yeah, let's start it well, over. I think national parks are important. We, we as a society need to have places to visit and unwind. Um, uh, as you probably know and read my story about growing up and um, growing up low income, I didn't have a ton of exposure to uh, public land. You know, I lived in Colorado. It's a beautiful state. There are tons of mountains and hiking trails. And rarely did I get to experience that because, you know, oftentimes it was a matter of my mother not having enough money to even get us to the mountains. And if we did, it was the closest hills we could get to. And that was our version of a picnic or camping. And so, you know, now that I'm older and I have yet to visit the Grand Canyon, and that's on my bucket list just because now I live in Arizona, and I'm able to, um, I, I want to ensure that it's going to be available for me to visit. And if the uranium mining occurs, there's the potential that the water in the area will be contaminated, and who knows what other um, repercussions could happen from that. And so I want to ensure that, that it doesn't happen so that everyone can visit the Grand Canyon. Great. So you uh, hear Lynn's story there. And so I'd like you just to take a moment and in the chat, just uh, answer at least one of these three questions. Um, what was your experience? And we want to hear, we're going to ask you about your visit to the Grand Canyon. So what was your experience or what are your impressions of the Grand Canyon? What experiences motivate you to take action to protect the Grand Canyon? And what are the consequences of inaction for you? So uh, you'll see that in the chat. Camilla is putting the uh, questions there. Describe your experience or your impressions of the Grand Canyon. What experiences motivate you to take action to protect the Grand Canyon? And what are the consequences of inaction for you? So if you just write that in the chat, that would be great. You can abbreviate. So Morgan writes that uh, her impression is her first impression was how vast and beautiful um, it was. So Amy wrote that uh, something that motivates her experiences that motivate her to protect the Grand Canyon is taking my sisters to visit and having future generations be able to enjoy the Grand Canyon. Becca says during her freshman year at Northern Arizona University in an astrobiology class, it was her first time visiting and it was breathtaking. She couldn't believe it was real. So many people say that they think it looks like a, they think your pictures are really like a postcard. They're not like they're not real pictures. Um, she says, prior to then, I couldn't have afforded to visit, but financial aid paid for my class fee, so I got to go. That is so cool. Camilla writes, she's seen it from the air flying over on her way to Las Vegas, and it was just as awe-inspiring from above as it was from the ground. We'll give a few more minutes. Uh, Lauda says I'm motivated to take, well, a lot of them are coming in. Um, let's see. One of the most favorite visits was in the wintertime, the quiet snow in the, can, in the canyon. Not a lot of people around. Stayed in a little old cabin on the rim. Our daughter, who's now 31, was really little. 
and I was expecting my son who's now 26. So look at that, 31 years ago, but still uh, that memory comes to mind. Breathtaking, I was 11 years old the first time I visited and thought it looked like a photograph. Yeah, that is so great. Well, thank you for doing that. Um, so now I want you to ask this, finish out this, this sentence for me. We're gonna break you up into pairs at random. You're gonna go into a breakout room and I want you to finish the sentence. And again, we'll write the sentence um, for you so you can see it. Protecting the Grand Canyon from uranium mining is personal to me because, finish out the sentence. Protecting the Grand Canyon from uranium mining is personal to me because. Okay, now we're gonna go into pairs and go into a breakout room. And we had a great conversation in my in my group. Um, so does anybody want to share? We have some time for like two people to share um, to finish out the sentence protecting the Grand Canyon from uranium mining is personal to me because who would like to share just um, just write in the chat or just wave if you're on camera just wave or write in the chat. I want to share. Let's see. So, oh great, Becca, perfect. Yeah, Becca, would you share? Let's see, just if you can, un we'll unmute you or you can unmute, perfect. Okay, Becca, share share the, the completion of the sentence. Awesome, thank you. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, awesome. So um, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, protecting the Grand Canyon from uranium mining is personal to me because it holds life. Um, and I think that that's something that everybody can relate to, um, whether it's um, in indigenous life, whether whether it's water, um, whether it's you know protecting different species um, that are there. Um, it holds life. Oh my gosh, I love that. That is so good because we always say like "Awa es viva," but you're right, like the Grand Canyon. I also think of the Grand Canyon is a living, uh, you know, entity too. Like it's that so that is so great. Thank you for sharing that. That was poetic, Becca. I just want to do some snaps to that. Right, right. I know. It really is. I know. That was really profound. Yep. Who else would like to share? Uh, let's see. I can't see if anybody else. So how about if I just, hey, Michael, do you mind sharing? I mean, I thought it was really cool. This is Michael from New York, like, which is so cool, right? And he's He's been to the Grand Canyon a few times. And so would you mind sharing, Michael? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I'm going to say protecting the Grand Canyon from uranium mining is personal to me because I've been there a couple times and I've seen how special it is. And I would hate for any of it to be damaged or degraded uh, in any way. Because even if any of this proposed stuff happens technically outside park boundaries, it's, it's all one big interconnected system, land, water, you know, wildlife, people. So anything that happens, you know, will have much bigger effects. And I don't want the experience marred by anything. You don't want dump trucks going driving back and forth or the water getting radioactive or, you know, it's, as Teddy Roosevelt said, leave it as it is. You cannot improve on it. He was talking about the Grand Canyon over 100 years ago, and it's just as true now as it was then. So. Yes, absolutely. Well, great. Well, I really, that, that, yeah, I mean, that is so amazing. And see, it just, it touched all of us, the Grand Canyon, whether you, it's, whether it's in the backyard like me, um, or whether it's somebody, um, you know, who's living in New York. And I want to invite all of you to share your story. Um, Camilla talked about, we're embarking on this um, My Grand Canyon story, and we want to have uh, 20 people um, we want to interview at least 20 people to do a little vignette like you saw that Lynn did, Lynn Cordova. We will produce that. We'll interview you and produce that. You'll, Amy is the one that will, uh, who's our communications coordinator, will produce that with you, interview you at a time that's convenient. So if you want to be interviewed, you'd like to be interviewed for a My Grand Canyon story just like Lynn, uh, please let us know now in the chat. Just say, you know, I want to share my story or yes, I want to be, I want to, you know, I want to do that um, or put share my story. And again, we'll arrange a time when it's convenient for you to be interviewed. It's not a long interview. It probably takes like, what, 20 minutes? 
um, then you send us the headshot and we put together, if you have any pictures of you at the Grand Canyon, um, if you've been there, whether you were you know, two years old or recently, we fold in your photos and um, then we put the, we, we produce the piece, share it with you, you approve it, and um, then we share your story. So that would be great. I see that um, some folks are interested. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we will be getting in contact with you. That would be that would be just super. Thank you. And if you um, haven't signed up and you want to think about it or want to do it, just any time during this um, time that we're with you tonight, just let us know, and we'll also send you an email as a follow up to ask you. Okay, great. So now I'm going to turn it over and. Um, I know that we are getting up against our time, but let me turn over to you, Amy, um, for the next slide about using our social media for advocacy, which a lot of people already know how to do that. So this would just be a quick refresher. Yes, yes, thank you. So if we could go back to the slide um, to talk about our Can you see media. the slide? Is the slide showing? Uh, no, I do not see the slide. I okay. see myself in a spotlight, which is always a little uncomfortable. <laughs> but How's that? Perfect. Thank you okay. so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we talked about it a little bit before, um, and people in this meeting unanimously, overwhelmingly said that they have advocated for something on social media, which is really, really cool. I'm sure that you all are already social media advocacy experts, but We'll just cover some tips to see if there's anything that we could improve on. Um, but we'll start off with the, the question, why? Why use social media for advocacy? Um, social media is important for advocacy because we can educate and raise awareness about an issue or cause. Um, it inspires, motivates, and unites people to support the cause. It, it includes a call to action. And you know, usually the people that we're friends with on Facebook, we're friends with on Facebook. And so I feel like they're more inclined to listen to what we have to say, especially when it's something that we're passionate about. Um, and so how do we advocate on social media? What are some ways that we can advocate on social media? So first and foremost, of course, there's creating a post on your own that supports the cause. Um, and these are very effective. You share your own photo, you share your own video, and this is your connection, this is your tie to what you're speaking about in your post. Um, another way that you can use social media for advocacy is to share or retweet an advocacy post. That is very helpful um, in making sure that it gets spread, that people get to see it. Um, you can encourage others to join and support a call, or join, let me start over, my gosh, I'm sorry. Encourage others to join and then support your cause um, with a clear call to action. Uh, and then you can use a hashtag. For example, the one that we're using is hashtag my Grand Canyon story. And then you always want to make sure that you're tagging relevant people and organizations. Um, they will um, usually share and help amplify your posts, your message, your voice, your story to the folks that follow them. And it is helpful in amplifying those stories. So when we go back, I think, when was it, like 2015, uh, the, when the ALS, the Ice Bucket Challenge was a really big deal. I'm not sure if folks remember, um, but it was a really big deal. We saw celebrities do it. We saw our neighbors do it. We saw all these, all sorts of people do it, um, just dumping ice on their heads. And we were like, what are these people doing? Like, virality, ha ha. But the Ice Bucket Challenge was really compelling. Um, not only did it raise awareness about ALS, it also raised over $100 million for the ALS Association. And when we talk about and think about call to action and a clear call to action, ALS had that double mission, right? They were raising awareness, but they also were able to raise that money, which was ultimately their call to action. And so that was a very compelling um, hashtag and a very compelling example about using social media for advocacy. So we're going to take a few seconds now and practice how to use social media for advocacy. So uh, Camilla will be providing the link in the chat box. 
and it will be the Facebook link for the uh, My Grand Canyon story that we showed earlier that's Lynn's. So something that you can do is share that video uh, and share your own Grand, My Grand Canyon story, exactly what we just talked about, why you feel that the Grand Canyon should be protected. Um, your call to action is encouraging others to share their Grand Canyon story. Of course, make sure to tag Echo so that we can share your story and amplify it with our followers and anybody who will listen about the importance of protecting the Grand Canyon. Um, or if Facebook isn't your jam and you're more active on Instagram, um, you can go ahead and pull your phone out. You can search for us on Instagram. Our handle is at Itchel Online. Our first, our most recent post is Lynn's video, Lynn's Grand Canyon story. So go ahead and like that and comment that, and that'll help us reach more people um, and spread the word, right? So once you've done that, uh, go ahead and drop it into our Zoom chat and uh, let us know what platform you chose to share on and that you did it. And Yay. we'll do some virtual claps. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Amy. Um, I think we, we, since we're running up on the hour, um, we have one more thing. Actually, we have two more things to do. Um, we uh, will hope that you will go and find that on either Facebook or Instagram and get the word out um, of Lynn's uh, video. That would be really helpful using the call to action and, and encouraging people to do that. Um, the next, so I wanted to skip ahead to the next um, and the last action, which is super simple and basically takes no time at all to go and join the Digital Advocacy Network. Um, why? Uh, because you'll receive new information about important issues like the one we covered today, uranium mining at the Grand Canyon. Uh, you'll receive email action alerts and opportunities to get involved. And you'll also be joining a network of people who are coordinating their actions that will have a big impact in their numbers. And so on our website, we have a page with the form. Um, so you can um, go sign up there. We'd love to have you join. Um, and we'd love to welcome new members to that. It's actually a new program. And so we're really hoping to kick it off with 50 um, members before the end of June. And so also we're asking that you're, you'll help get the word out and we'll send you some social media to help get the word out about that as well. Um, so here's just a little um, visual of what the form looks like. So let us know um, if you want to sign up and you're not able to right now uh, in the chat box as well. Um, and then I think before we go, I wanted to, um, and before I pass it back to Liz for doing a really quick checkout with everybody and we do a group photo together, I, I want to hand it over to Nikki Julian of the Arizona Wildlife Federation um, because um, we are so proud to be able to honor our wonderful colleague and supervisor Liz Archuleta for being, uh, for winning, for being awarded the honor of a woman in conservation leadership. So I wanna pass it off to Nikki. Thank you. So um, we did present this award to Liz at the commissioner's meeting in April, but um, it's so gorgeous. I wanted to do it again. <laughs> um, thank you, Liz, for, uh, for being such a, um, a wonderful inspiration to um, to everyone for uh, what you're doing with um, with uh, helping to create resilient communities in the face of climate change. And um, thank you for being a partner to us. And thank you for uh, for all the work you do. It's been wonderful to meet you and and uh, and to work with you. Wow. Yay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. That is that is so incredible, and it is an amazing and honor to be recognized uh, with the Arizona Wildlife Federation Conservation Award. Thank you for women and women leaders in conservation. I really appreciate that. And um, now, if you all can help with the effort, that would be great. And the way you can do that is by signing on for our Digital Action Network, which um, in the chat right now is the link to it. And um, it literally, it will take just two minutes. So if you wanna click on that in the chat, 
and um, go to the um, www.echoonline.org and it's Echo Advocacy Network. But if you click on that link right there um, that we have in the chat, you'll be able to sign on. And we just basically ask for your name and your email, a way to contact you. Um, and then you'll be able to get action alerts, um, asking you to take some action to let uh, friends and family know about um, what we're advocating for and for you to be one of our advocates and part of our network. And we, of course, ECHO is um, a partner and with the Arizona Wildlife Federation. And um, this is, this is how we're building our coalitions. Thank you so much, Nikki, that was great. So we'll give you just a couple of minutes and then we're gonna have a, a close out. Oh, thank you so much, Lauda, for uh, signing up. Uh, Laura Naranjo um, with New Mexico, right? Signing up for the Advocacy Network. Thank you, thank you so much, Laura for doing that. Let us know when you've signed up. Okay, and as you are signing up, we're going to also do a group photo and then have a checkout. And so, Amy, I'm gonna turn it over to you to get us set up for a group photo. Yes, okay, and everyone. Turn your cameras on and on the count of three. Uh, we will be taking a picture with everyone. So here goes, one, two, three, smile. Wonderful, thanks everyone. That's great. Okay, we're gonna do a quick checkout. And um, let us just first thank you so much for spending this hour with us. Uh, a couple of reminders, uh, post on social media. Second of all, um, make sure that um, you sign up for the Digital Action Network, it shows uh, DAN, D-A, and Digital Action Network. And um, now we're gonna check out. And what I want you us to do is just to think of one word that comes to your mind when you think about the Grand Canyon. So verbalize one word that comes to your mind when you are when you think about the Grand Canyon, and that'll be our checkout for tonight. And again, we'll spotlight you, and that'll be your cue that it's your turn to uh, say goodbye and the one word you want to share. Amy, awesome! Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, I think the word that I would use to describe the Grand Canyon uh, for me is tradition. Tradition. Great. Uh, azure, the color blue. Ah. Uh, Michael. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yes. So I would say humbling is the mm. word that comes to mind. And great seeing everyone tonight. Thanks again for putting it together. I'll see you next time. My one word is majestic. Okay, Teresa? Uh, maybe two words, earth tone. Earth tone, oh, neat. Great, Laura. Irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. Morgan. <laughs> this was so hard. I think that I would say home. Vast. Yeah. Becca. Sacred. Sacred. And there's a couple people on the phone that I can't spotlight by video. Rebecca. And Viviana. Viviana, you want to go? What's your one word? Breathtaking. Great. Rebecca, do you want to go? What's your one word when you think of the Grand Canyon? She's off. She's off. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Anybody else? My word is gorgeous. <laughs> and I have um, one word that describes how I feel tonight and also about the Grand Canyon. I, uh, my one word is gratitude. Um, I have immense gratitude uh, for having that in basically my backyard and immense gratitude for being able to spend um, some time with you this evening and talking about uh, something that's really personal and precious to me, um, Grand Canyon National Park and all of its uh, majesty. It's just an amazing place. And so um, with that, I want to thank you. I want to invite you to join us for the second part of this series, which will be um, next month. We will send you a hold the date um, for that second half where we're going to ask for an hour of your time um, as well. And we look forward to seeing you next month. In the meantime, stay safe and um, look for some updates and emails from us again, asking you to join our digital action network and um, giving you some updates about the Grand Canyon. And also probably sending you some great Grand Canyon photos so you can put on your screensaver or also use it as your background on these Zoom meetings. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a great thanks, night. Everybody.